So good morning. Uh, my name is Ken Dix. I'm CEO of Life365. Uh, welcome to our first series of town halls related to COVID-19 telehealth and remote patient monitoring. Before I introduce our panelists for this morning, I want to take a minute and thank all the healthcare providers, first responders, family caregivers, home health care workers, child care providers, food and grocery delivery, transportation, and healthcare manufacturers, and any others that are running back in to fight this virus. Thank you. I also wanted to take, uh, let you know that everyone will be on mute and then we'll accept questions via chat and to try to entertain a few questions throughout the webinar. We have reserved some time for questions at the end. If you don't, if we don't get to your questions, we will answer them after the webinar and post the recorded video on the life365.health website tomorrow. Now, I want to take a minute and introduce our distinguished panelists. First, uh, Mario Vasu. Mario, uh, would you like to take a minute and introduce yourself? Sure. <clears throat> Mario Vasu, uh, Chief Operating Officer for Life365. Uh, my background uh, has been in technology for the last 30 plus years. Uh, I've uh, developed and created uh, uh, over 35 uh, apps uh, in the medical space. Uh, my background uh, uh, is also in, uh, in video games and gamification. Thank you. And also Tom Spencer from Healthy Med. I'd like to introduce Tom. Hello everyone, this is Tom Spencer and I am the CEO of Healthy Med. We're based out of Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, my career has been spent in physician management, uh, health plan marketing and medical technology. Uh, innovation. Thank you, Tom. So now I'm going to go through and, and, and share a screen with you and go over our um, presentation that we want to, you know, share with you today. It's my feeling and the reason why we're doing uh, somewhat of an intimate presentation with Light 365 is because I believe that we all need to work together. Uh, my team has been doing that for a while. That's why we have Tom with us. That's why we have key partners. Uh, especially having to go through and very specifically target towards COVID-19. It just happens to that telehealth is now starting to take a big turn in being instrumental in this, along with telemedicine and remote patient monitoring. And a lot of us, I know we have investors on the phone. I know we have strategics on the phone or on the, sorry, on the Zoom. Uh, but we also have, you know, what I consider uh, cooperation, right, as well. Other you know, people that are working in the space next to us or with us. And I believe we need to cooperate and partner and work together to go after this crisis as it is right now. So let me uh, go through. And again, if you have any questions whatsoever, I'll try to uh, try to get to them as fast as I can. Let me go through and uh, go through the, our town hall. Let me get to the right page real quick. Uh, so about Light365, I want to go through, and I don't totally want this to be a Light365 um, you know, commercial, but we're going to go through and talk about it. We want to be able to enable consumers empowered in healthcare anywhere, anytime, and I think that's very relevant now with uh, COVID-19. Uh, yesterday, we had a very, I believe, successful um, uh, uh, webinar uh, with Dr. David Shulkin, uh, Ninth Secretary of the... Um, of the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, um, Dr. Uh, Bob Arnott, um, you know, a physician, a chief medical correspondent for CBS and NBC, a philanthropist uh, as well, and has really done a lot of work around pandemics and epidemics throughout the world. And Dr. Madad Shafa, who is Life365's chief medical officer and advisor to the company. We've posted, we've uploaded the video from yesterday uh, to YouTube. I put it out on LinkedIn uh, today as well, but we will be providing you with the link uh, to the YouTube video, or you can, you can go out on YouTube and find it under Life365 as well. Today, as I mentioned, we're gonna talk with uh, myself about Life365, but also Mari Vasu on Life365 and Avicenna and Tom Spencer, which I've had, uh, Mario and I have had the pleasure of meeting uh, over the last several months, uh, being out of Minnesota, working on a major project. 
The other thing I want to mention too, uh, for those listening, is that we have been very, very fortunate to be part of the plug and play uh, family. Uh, we're part of the plug and play um, group for uh, Health Batch 10. Uh, plug and play is in 34 countries. If you don't know about it, it's out of Silicon Valley. It brings together large enterprise uh, customers and strategics and investors uh, to try to find the best you know, solutions in the marketplace to address issues. Um, recently, there were 900 companies that were vetted from digital health worldwide. And it was narrowed down by investors and strategics to the top 19 and Life365 was, form, was uh, privileged to be part of that, um, that batch cohort. Uh, the graduates that have come out of plug and play have been uh, companies like Dropbox, plug and, uh, PayPal <clears throat> and others. So I wanna go through really quickly our main emphasis uh, with this. Like you, a lot of our emphasis has changed over the last month or two, last 30 days because of COVID. So we're working on COVID-19 uh, process where we go through and do a platform together where we can educate, assess, test, connect, and monitor. Um, and we do have some key partners in this that we're putting together kits that we can kind of talked about. Uh, Life 365 has the ability to have its kits that we put together. A lot of people are asking for thermometers and pulse oximeters in some cases, um, you know, blood pressure devices. Yes, supplies are limited. Um, the good thing is that we see that China is coming back online. Uh, there'll be a lot of demand for manufacturing that's coming out of China uh, from that perspective. Uh, so uh, we are trying to put in orders early to be able to get uh, connected devices, but as much as we can. One of the things that came off of the, uh, the conference call from yesterday um, or the webinar from yesterday was the fact that um, we kept on asking the question, is this just temporary? Is it gonna be through May or June timeframe uh, with COVID and the pandemic, or is it gonna be into the fall and into the spring? And really, I think, don't think the doctors could really answer if it's gonna go into the fall timeframe. Most experts that we see uh, believe that it will. It just depends on how well we do with the social distancing and isolation. And if we get, can get our technology to work from home, sorry about that this morning. Um, but, you know, we are preparing, I believe as an industry, that this is gonna go into the fall timeframe. We don't know how big it's gonna be and we need to be prepared and putting systems together. And that's what Life365 is doing all around COVID-19. We're fortunate to have partners uh, with AMR uh, Ambulance with Global Medical Re uh, Response. Um, and they allow us to be able to go through on a much broader scale uh, with bigger clients to be able to go through and do uh, triaging, uh, nurse visit, nurse navigation, and call center monitoring. Um, as you can imagine, they're extremely busy uh, from, uh, from the pandemic. Um, I think at this count, they've got close to 200 paramedics uh, and first responders that are quarantined themselves. And that's one of the things that we talked about yesterday is really, um, you know, the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the likelihood that first responders and healthcare workers are going to get sick. And it's very worrisome to us. The other thing is a partner with us in uh, Admiral, Rear Admiral Ray, uh, Robert Ray from Blue Star in the DC area. Uh, in providing uh, call center monitoring, they can actually outreach uh, to patients on a regular basis, daily, weekly, monthly, uh, to be able to do that and provide connected solutions as well. And we can bundle these solutions together. We have a great partner with us also in uh, Tuzag, uh, which does conversational AI, which allows us to be able to bundle a variety of solutions together um, to be able to go through and connect patients. It's not one solution fits all or one size fits all. So I wanna take a moment, we've shared this with the group of you over the last, you know, probably uh, a week or two, but Mario that's on the call right now, you and Dr. Shafa actually run Avicenna and, and provided the, uh, the assessment tool. Why don't you talk a little bit about what Avicenna is doing as far as assessments in the COVID crisis? Sure, so Avicenna's background is uh, population health and we've developed uh, a suite of uh, tools uh, that basically lets us uh, uh, monitor patient care across the uh, spectrum of care, um, both pre and post-discharge. 
Um, so we have a system in place that allowed us to create a, an assessment, uh, what we call a self-assessment uh, for uh, people that might be worried about having the COVID-19 virus. Uh, so it's a very simple uh, program. Uh, is this uh, active, Kent? That this is live, yeah. Get live yet? Let's go ahead and go to the to the resources. And in partnership with uh, Life365, uh, we created this as a public service. Uh, but we also have uh, upcoming a care coordinator side to this. So currently the data is, is not saved. It's for informational purposes only uh, to help alleviate people's fears. Um, but we also have a clinical side that allows us to collect data and do some pre-triaging uh, that uh, basically will help uh, care providers uh, mitigate the potential onslaught of uh, thousands and thousands of uh, patients calling their offices uh, looking for help. Um, so Kent, if, if you can go and, and go ahead and go into the uh, demo, I can show the demo. So basically what it does is it asks you uh, eight to 10 questions uh, that are the questions that both uh, the CDC and the WHO have put out there. Uh, it takes that and gives you a score and then basically gives you a very simple message. It basically says, this is nothing to worry about. Uh, contact your doctor if you have any ongoing concerns or um, you know, seek immediate medical attention. Um, so again, very simple. Uh, it's out there for the public, anybody in the public to, to see. And uh, it's part of our, our uh, contribution to, to the cause. So Mario, tell me a little bit about what would the provider side look at? This is more the, uh, the member or patient side that could do an evaluation. What would the provider side look like? So the provider side gets more in depth on the questions. It also starts looking at um, who that patient may have been in contact with. It starts collecting data, relevant data that can be used uh, for uh, government, you know, that right now with the CDC, it's the collecting of that data is gonna be really critical. And then uh, also to provide better service to patients. Uh, and then as important to, to many service providers out there with the CMS uh, releasing uh, some of the reimbursement codes uh, towards telemedicine, telehealth, uh, it allows you the, the care coordinators, doctors to, to track their uh, sessions with uh, patients. Great, that's great. And as, as we start getting new guidance out, you guys will be under uh, Dr. Shafa's guidance. You'll be actually updating uh, this on the, on the website as well as part of the tool. Exactly, exactly. Right. It's, it's a live tool. So uh, as we are collecting data, relevant data uh, from the CDC and WHO, uh, we're adding uh, new parameters uh, to the questions. Uh, okay, great, that's wonderful. So, and I think you envisioned that this is actually gonna be part of the app that goes out as well, right, with this. So, um, you know, as far as when we talk about the app, there's gonna be a, a part of assessment uh, as far as upfront, uh, potentially linking to testing locations. Um, there's gonna be uh, potentially, um, you know, connected devices. We could talk about the kits being, having thermometer and pulse oximeter, maybe blood pressure in it. Uh, linked to the clinical backend system, and then using, depending on the circumstances, linked into resources like Blue Star, AMR, and other cases as well, because some of our clients already have monitoring call centers as well. I mean, correct. you're developing, sorry, go ahead. Um, no, you're, you're correct. The, uh, the, the system is set up uh, not only to collect data, to, but also more importantly, to create actionable items. So uh, basically uh, the doctor can uh, uh, set up uh, what the next steps for that patient are. Uh, they need to be transported to an emergency room. They can set that up through the, the app. Uh, if they uh, need to go to a specialist and it's a, a non-COVID-19 uh, related item, uh, they can then refer it to uh, an al alternative uh, medical source. Okay, great. And again, if you guys have any questions whatsoever, you know, please uh, put them in as well. One of the things that we believe that is instrumental in what we're doing is uh, not only creating kits uh, that are out there that are for COVID, we wanna make this as simple as possible. We have aligned with a distributor that's here in Arizona and Texas 
that does all the kitting for us uh, in a secure environment, a clean environment from that as well. And then the uh, kits can actually be paired and actually shipped directly to the patient or to our client, either way that they want to do that. So everything when it comes together should come out of the box uh, seamlessly, right? And be able to um, be able to start recording uh, uh, biometrics right away uh, from this. Uh, the kits that we typically have, we've been having out there are chronic care kits, diabetes kits, uh, cardiac kits, kidney kits, respiratory, and now COVID, right? From that as well. And again, we really believe the COVID kits are going to be a combination of spirometry, uh, maybe in the future nebulizers, right, as well. Uh, we've been asked to um, potentially interface to vents uh, for, you know, for uh, uh, changing uh, settings as well. But right now we're keeping it very, very simple uh, with uh, pulse oximetry, um, temperature, blood pressure, and eventually spirometry as well. Um, and then use cases really quickly where we want to be able to have, you know, if we use AMR or your own systems that are out there, where we want to be able to, when people are visiting homes, our whole objective is to try to keep people out of the emergency room, out of the hospital. We talked about it a little bit yesterday in, you know, the circle of care where we have the first responders and the ED uh, um, uh, physicians and nurses that are in the hospital um, and trying to uh, serve the sick of the sick, we wanna to try to be help enable the secondary ring, which is paramedics and first responders and trying to connect to people that are outside the hospital, trying to triage uh, with uh, Avicenna and other tools that are out there to make sure that it's right for the patient to be going into a needy or into a clinical setting um, or suggested. And then the other one is empowering patients themselves or family caregivers, right, to be able to uh, use the technology and be monitored from exist existence. A good example is Chris Como, right, that's on CNN. He now has been diagnosed uh, with uh, COVID-19. He was showing last night, you know, a pulse oximeter that he's using on a regular basis. He's getting, you know, them shipped to him on a regular basis and uh, temperature, right, as well. And so, you know, we wanted you, you know, connect to, on that third ring, we wanna to connect to patients like that, that have been diagnosed potentially, even pre, you know, pre asymptomatic patients as well, but it had been diagnosed and we wanna be able to help connect and monitor them from a distance so that they don't have to go back into the ER or into the hospital. We wanna be extension of the healthcare system. In addition, there's multiple different use cases we can use uh, where people um, are going to be monitored at home or by paramedics um, or where paramedics are showing up or first responders or family caregivers and trying to go out and uh, connect patients together and have them uh, get their proper medication, their proper, proper treatment as well. Uh, part of the thing that Mario and team you know, are working on, I thought we'd just show this up, is our virtual care platform. In our virtual care platform, although we've had to shift towards COVID uh, right now, is meant to try to empower patients in their own care um, and to be able to give them a variety of tools when we're working with payers to be able to go through and drive it off of their benefits. When we're working with providers to try to drive it off of their care plan uh, from that. So we wanna be able to um, empower patients uh, in their own structure and their own benefits. The other thing that I just wanna show really quickly and we have to decipher what is real today that's implementable and what is roadmap because all of that has been changing. Everything that's on here is in, uh, in our cycle uh, that we've been working on and putting out. The things that we're um, emphasizing the most today uh, are our kits, you know, our, um, our hubs, uh, our tablets with two-way video, our clinical backend system uh, with us as well. And with partners like Tuzag, uh, we'll be putting out conversational AI as well uh, to be able to, um, to connect to patients in a variety of ways that are out there. I think that one thing that's very you know, important for us to, to uh, realize is the power of data. 
and if I really have the compassion of working with with patients, I, you know, thank God, don't know of anybody with COVID-19 yet, uh, but I will uh, from that, um, and personally, uh, and I think we all will know people with COVID-19, and I just, I, I just believe if we can try to get a whole ahead of it in some way. So Ken's is a great example. You know, Ken's has been featured on multiple different, you know, TV shows over the last, you know, week or two, by very simply putting a thermometer out, you know, to patients, and they've got over a million thermometers that are spread throughout the United States, and they've had that for the last two or three years. These are data points where we can now get real-time data from patients on a regular basis, or don't have to be a patient from people, and feed it into the back-end system uh, to be able to allow um, to see where trends are occurring. Uh, it, even before the CDC has it, if you look at the antiquated system of reporting flu uh, and infectious disease right now, it could take three weeks to get to the CDC and even longer to come up with some type of trending. As you can see from Kenza's maps, they show places like New York as a hotspot and Illinois and Michigan as a hotspot and Washington as a hotspot, but they show Florida on fire. And this is from a week ago. So the power of us to have, you know, um, the power for us to have connected data getting biometric devices is incredibly powerful, especially during this time, right, that's out there. Just want to point out we have a good a good solid team that's been working with us ever since our last company that sold to Alir Abbott. Uh, now we're together again and working on this and bringing it together. So let me let me go into um, full screen mode again with this, and hopefully you guys can see it. Can you guys see the screen? Tom? Yes. Okay, good. So let's go into you know the plug and play presentation really quickly. Uh, what we're delivering. Uh, we again uh, empowering consumers. We've got great relationships uh, with a um, uh, very award-winning team. Great relationships from an accelerator standpoint, Mayo Clinic, uh, Plug and Play, BioXL, uh, who are investors in us. Relationships with AMR, j and Medical, uh, and uh, HNC out of Wixom, uh, Michigan. Great partners with us. And then it's not relevant to COVID right now, but our four, our patent portfolio, and uh, they're very, very strategic coming forward. Uh, we wanna bridge the gap in closing the chasm between digital health. There's a lot of digital health solutions that you're now seeing in the marketplace uh, where um, people are trying to reach out and say, what works with what, what integrates to what. We wanna be able to solve that problem in the, the intermediate and long-term as well. I kind of put this uh, slide out here to kind of show um, the evolution of remote patient monitoring and where we are addressing, although there's been remote patient monitoring one, which I don't think was a very big marketplace out there, remote patient monitoring two, which has wireless technology and IoT uh, technology. It may be larger than $150 million marketplace in the US today, especially as we're starting to grow. But our team is really focused on RPM3. It's really focused on the virtual care platform, bringing solutions together on a common platform using disposable, wearable sensor patch technology to be able to be connected by the cloud, to the cloud, driven by artificial intelligence, and be able to go to a broader population of patients in a more economical manner, right, to be able to do that. We don't wanna just use RPM over with the 5% that consume 50% of healthcare costs. We certainly don't wanna do that with COVID-19. We wanna go through and try to get, especially when we start getting data analytics working and the right data at the right time to get the right outcome at the right cost, we wanna get into the middle of that curve. We wanna to try to be proactive and try to head it off, which means we're dealing with a much broader, a much larger population, but we're also going through and not dealing with people that are going through and, and uh, spending a lot on healthcare costs quite yet, right, with that. So one solution doesn't fit all, you've gotta be able to have a variety of solutions uh, to be able to uh, connect and monitor and engage uh, patients. So again, we put the patients at the center of this. We try to um, bring all of their um, uh, needs around, which could be 
data integration, it could be behavioral health, it could be logistics, it could be engagement nurse navigation with our partners on a common platform to be able to um, bring uh, the best healthcare to them. And then when we're dealing with platforms, we wanna make it easy to download our app to be able to be a highly personalized you know, by the patient. If I'm looking at an app that has benefits from me or a care plan from me, I shouldn't be seeing um, catheters and wheelchairs and diapers on my app. I should be th seeing things that are very relevant to me in the app that allows me to do things. Did you know, you know that you have the ability to get a Silver Sneakers membership? Did you know that your payer pays for Lyft and Uber rides? Did you know you know, that, you know, we can refill your medication automatically. There are things that are part, and these are partners. Did you know that we can have the testing lab come to you to do a blood draw instead of you having to go to the testing lab? These are partners that actually can be integrated into our platform and work together. So I wanna mention this, you know, from the strength, I'll talk about the next generation because that's why part of you are here is to talk about it but we believe we're gonna to have to deal with a large population of patients. We know we're gonna to have to drive it through um, artificial intelligence and to be personalized, aligned with the solution for the patient. But we're gonna utilize our wearable sensor and patch technology and utilize the four patents that we have today. Uh, we have 12 uh, applications that are pending, about eight office actions. Uh, Life 65 does hold the, um, the uh, patents and IP to allow wearable and sensor technology and companies to scale to that larger, um, that larger population. And in saying that, we are looking for partners, large partners that are out there to be able to, um, to share our patent portfolio with, right, to, uh, to work together in trying to go after this lot, much larger market. So let's go into uh, the next uh, thing that we really wanna talk about. Uh, with this is uh, the large vulnerable population. And that's why we have, you know, Tom Spencer on the phone to talk about it. Uh, Tom, from your perspective, just introduce yourself and tell me a little bit more about Healthy Med and the initiatives. Well, uh, thank you, Kent. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all the uh, would-be producers out there for all the suggestions to help us get back on track. Uh, yeah. And uh, so thank you for that. Um, Healthy Med was uh, really founded to address a problem. And the problem was the most vulnerable and the most expensive users of the healthcare system in the state of Minnesota. Now, there are a couple of elements about the state of Minnesota. One I'll mention now, and you can ask questions about it if you're interested. But the state of Minnesota is the only state in the union that actually operates a GPO for pharmacy. And it has 49 state contracts in addition to Minnesota with all the states to supply medications through that GPO. Last year, that, that group called MCAP, Infuse, did a pass through or flow through of drug sales of about $2 billion which actually puts it uh, among the top uh, GPOs in the country. So uh, it's a very, very innovative uh, state in terms of reaching out to uh, the vulnerable populations. And one of the things that we created Healthy Med for was to reach out to them in a very unique way. And as you're looking at this slide, you see a television on the wall of this senior, uh, we would think that this senior is probably a dual eligible for Medicare and Medicaid benefits. But on the wall, this television is showing the stats, the health score, if you will, of the uh, enrollee in the Medicaid program. And that could be a daughter, it could be a nurse navigator helping her understand her results. And the importance of this is, is that this is a way now that we can get control of the new setting, which we think is the home. And why would we put a television and other remote patient monitoring devices in the home? Well, simply because the patient in this crisis, we can see this very clearly, has a need to reach out to the healthcare system. So in other words, 
it isn't just the hospital reaching into the home or the physician's office reaching into the home at the time of need. The patient and the patient's caregivers and the patient's nurses in, in attendance need to be able to reach out in a real-time feedback loop with their caregivers and say, hey, something's wrong. And so by putting a system, the Healthy Med system in the home, we can be assured that we have that communication channel. The system it really is comprised of three elements. The television, which is a smart TV that uh, it uses Bluetooth or Zigbee or other signals to communicate with devices in the home. A video camera, widescreen video camera with uh, an excellent microphone system and a set-top box to act as a computer for uh, uploading and downloading certain data at certain speeds because not all the time do we need to be on a real-time mode. So by putting this system in the home, the healthcare system can now respond to actual needs uh, as coming from the patient population. Now, just a couple of things about this population so we're all clear and this is probably the genesis of the excitement in the project. I'll leave that to Kent and others to describe. But our population is a group that Minnesota describes in statute as special needs basic care individuals. And what does that really mean? Well, in dollar terms, it means that this population uses about $50,000 per enrollee per year of state funding to live in their home. Now, why would we spend that money? Well, there's no place to put them, right? We can institutionalize them. If we did that, the costs would be much higher. And more importantly, they're citizens, they're adults between the age of 18 and 64, not yet eligible for Medicare, and they wanna live as independently as they possibly can with their diseases and conditions that need this kind of care. So to put that in round numbers, we're spending about $127 per day on each of these 53,000 special needs individuals in the state. Now, it's important to realize as well that there's a clinical cohort of this type of person, the person with um, Lou Gehrig's disease, or the person with muscular dystrophy, or the person with spina bifida, for example, uh, and a whole host of psychiatric disorders that keep people at home. These people want to live alone or live with the help of others in their own home. And this is, a, this is the way that the state of Minnesota has chosen to deal with the problem. This clinical cohort exists in every state from Hawaii to Florida. And so if you roll them all up, there are about 5.2 million of these individuals in the United States today, and they consume about $247 billion of the Medicaid budget. And the Medicaid budget, for those who haven't looked at the, the CMS website recently, for the last closed period of data was about $259 billion uh, spent by all of the states combined in 2018. So that's this group. This is the group we're serving, and uh, we, we're very excited about it. So uh, Tom, let me ask you a question uh, about this as well. I mean, our mission over the lot before COVID-19 was actually to work towards putting, you know, medication adherence together, you know, using the TV, uh, using Dose Health and others that are out there as well. Um, has the mission, mission changed on that? Now that COVID's out there, um, aren't we trying to actually go through and protect this really highly vulnerable population and trying to keep them away from the ED or the hospitalization or actually stop uh, caseworkers maybe from going into the, the patient's home? Well, yeah, I think it has. Uh, I think all of us would admit one thing today to ourselves, and that is that the world has changed because of this pandemic. And uh, I think it's going to turn out for the good from the standpoint of telemedicine. And why is that? Well, uh, there are a couple of reasons, but the most important one is that all of us are vulnerable. 
to uh, the kind of thing that we're experiencing right now. I'm, I'm talking to you from my home. I'm sure uh, everybody else is at home watching this uh, or participating in this, this town hall. Yep. So uh, we're all vulnerable. But if you think about putting healthcare workers in the homes of the most vulnerable people in our community, and if those workers were somehow infected, it's probably a death sentence. If, if you really wrap your head around that, most of the people that we see in a special needs population, again, from Hawaii to Florida, are going to be majorly impacted by a respiratory virus of the kind that we see in COVID-19. Right. And that uh, is a death sentence. Right. It's also a death sentence to then see these uh, individuals who go into the homes, uh, if they're not part of the regular pattern, let's say they're an EMT from AMR, for example, and they were to come into the home and they were to spread that virus, they take that virus back into the community, into the hospital, into the ER perhaps, certainly the ambulance service, and the cycle continues. So I think what we're, we're starting to recognize is is that the home is a wonderful center of care if we can get the doctor and the pharmacist and a, a nurse practitioner perhaps on the line when they're needed to begin to deal with the symptoms right away. And yeah, I it's think clear from what we learned last night and the physicians that were on the line, uh, I know Dr. Arnott, I've known him for a number of years. I was very impressed with Dr. Shulkin and one of the questions that came up that was a very impressive answer by Dr. Shulkin was, what do you think is, is the result of, of, of this, this pandemic? And he said, I think telemedicine is going to rise and take the, its place in the mainstream of, of healthcare. And then there was a follow-up question to Dr. Shulkin, which went, well, why is it, is it not there now? And, and he said, because our, our U.S. healthcare system is run on a sickness care business model. It is not a business model that is coming from the patient or coming from the home setting. And so we're going to have to adapt and adapt very quickly in advance of, we would say certainly here in Minnesota, in advance of the second round of COVID and possibly a third cycle before the population develops an immunity. So we've got lots of work to do and we've got to do it very quickly and safely as possible. Yeah, that's, that's why I wanted to, to ask the question because I think our mandate in Minnesota and other places has changed to the high, at least from our perspective as a team, uh, we can't take on everything. Your team can't take on everything. I'm glad to be partnered together with you. Um, but it's to go through and now protect this highly vulnerable population. If we can get installed two-way video, right, uh, into the home, right, of the uh, highly vulnerable or special needs population, uh, it's already being, uh, it's already been appropriated, right, to be paid for, you know, by the state of Minnesota and other under federal uh, grants as well to be able to do this. Uh, we have now started putting partnerships together. You've started putting partnerships together uh, with both of us actually to do that, to try to address this as quickly as possible for, before that next wave does occur, right, as well. Well, you, you mentioned a very important point, and, and that is the partnerships. Uh, we're not going to take ownership of, of this entire project, its success, uh, which is, is certainly uh, more certain now because of all of the development around telemedicine and the understanding of its importance. But one of the things that uh, I think we want to make very, very clear to all of the people listening into this, this town hall is that the home has to be enabled as a new setting of healthcare. Now, if you go to the hospital, you spend time in the hospital, the setting, the hospital itself, before any professional service, physician, nursing, therapy uh, of any kind is delivered, is paid $2,000 a day. The ER is automatically billing 
at $1,500 a day, whether any service is performed or not, other than assessment as you walk in the door or are wheeled in. Uh, the nursing home is paid $650 a day in the Midwest for uh, subacute care, $225 in the Midwest for palliative care, and so on and so forth. And yet here we have a vulnerable population, approximately 7% of the entire population of our state is part of that vulnerable population if you include uh, uh, dual eligibles. Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries. And when you think about that, this has to be enabled now as part of a business model change. And what Healthy Med has done is it has contracted with the state of Minnesota to pay for the setting 24, 365. And that's remarkable. And some would say, well, well how can the state afford that? Our answer to that is very simple. How can it not afford it? If you're looking at a, a nursing home, even in palliative care at $225 a day, we're saying to the state that ultimately, we can make the home a setting of care for physician, nurse practitioner, and pharmacist services with a platform that's paid for, for far less than $25 a day. And that's possible because of telemedicine. So this is the hope. This is certainly where we're pointing toward. And uh, Ken, we're looking forward to working with you guys to help us get there. Yeah, what's interesting about all this, and, and next week we're gonna actually have another uh, webinar. Somebody else is gonna drive the technology other than me. I've already decided that. Good idea, Ken. Yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> you know, because technology baffles me. Um, but I shouldn't say that. Um, but you know, from, from this standpoint, that's why I started calling this series the new normal. Um, because, and people are using, you know, that phrase all over the place anyway. Um, but, you know, now that, you know, that doctors are going through and just saying, don't come in the office because we don't want COVID around or exposing you to it, just, you know, pick up and do, you know, a FaceTime or do a Skype. Uh, they're not even considering potentially HIPAA implications from it right now because it is the new normal. Um, once we get consumers over that line, Line, and I'm already hearing it uh, every single day now, that they have the convenience of not going to the doctor. They can schedule online. They can actually get the visit online from telemedicine or telehealth uh, from that perspective. And doctors that have the ability to better schedule their time and be able to see maybe more patients or the PA gets to see more patients on a regular basis. And the revenue streams are now flowing because of that. Um, I don't think we go back from this, All right? It's unfortunate that a pandemic you know, cause this to kind of occur, and we'll talk more about it next Wednesday night, about reimbursement and licensure and parity and alternate originating site uh, locations and the 1135 waivers. Um, but I just don't think we go back, right, from this. So that's, I just don't see it occurring. We will go back, you know, to more stringent regulations around HIPAA uh, from that. But I think opening up licensure, opening up, you know, parity, opening up reimbursement, is something that I think is is going to be mainstay, and and what's going to drive it is consumers and and healthcare professionals are going to say we need to have this in place to be able to get additional help around us when we need it uh, from that, and we also need to be able to benefit from it as well. So I think it's just the new normal that we're going through. One of the things that I wanted to you know go through your presentation really quickly. I think you've answered most of the questions with it. Um, but what is Life365's, you know, involvement, you know, in this going forward? I guess I'll just share the screen really quickly um, as well that we've, you know, between us, we've entered into an LOI, right, for us to be able to work together um, and form a corporation in Minnesota to be able to do that. We're going to be working uh, with your contracts that you have with the special needs a population that's already funded uh, from that. And we know the need that goes around that. Originally, we talked about it was going to be in medication adherence uh, and being able to install, um, you know, a TV in uh, every special needs home. I think you said there's like 53,000 uh, patients in uh, Minnesota that are uh, designated as special needs. Uh, from that, probably 12,000 that are in, or 15,000 in Hennepin County alone uh, from that. So we are st we're starting to uh, work to be able to, um, uh, 
start bundling uh, solutions that are put together. And one of the exciting announcements that you're putting uh, out there, and maybe you can talk a little bit about Best Buy, right? And how they're involved in this project. Well, it, certainly uh, it's a name that many, many uh, people know around the country. And uh, uh, Best Buy has a, a great reputation and have been interested, uh, interestingly enough, for about the past 20 years in getting into um, health-enabled systems in the home. Of course, it makes very much sense. And they've recently acquired for uh, more than a billion dollars two companies to help them get into the home and, and provide care for seniors and for the, uh, the employed population uh, for, from large self-insured employers and, and others. Uh, but what they have not been able to do until now, until we met and uh, began discussing our arrangement, they have not been able to really get into the government side of the payment stream. And so I think uh, uh, Best Buy, uh, I won't speak for their executive team, we're still at work on our plan uh, post COVID-19, but I think once we uh, leave uh, this first cycle of the virus uptick, uh, we'll, you will see Best Buy uh, teams from the Geek, Geek Squad, and uh, I'm not sure whether they're gonna rename that for this purpose, but the Geek Squad will be deployed to install uh, our system and train our system initially in the homes of the individuals that we are contracted to serve. So we're very excited about that. Yeah, and we know and that Geek, we know that Geek Squad has actually issued, you know, uh, an order of, a lot with the state orders that are out there that they're not having. Uh, I think they do a million installs per year, right, throughout the United States, or a million service calls per year. Um, that they're not going in to do installations, at least now through the end of April timeframe, which doesn't impact our schedule uh, from that. How it impacts, you know, going forward, you know, May through October timeframe, we don't know yet, but a lot of people don't know the uncertainties behind that as well. We do right. have workarounds. Uh, our, big, our big emphasis, you know, is to actually get uh, these patients or, or, or uh, individuals connected through two-way uh, two um, video and through telemedicine. And there are ways for us to be able to get um, tablets into the home uh, sooner than later to be able to get them connected to their PCP. I already know that there's been waivers that have been put in place for, um, for the, care, uh, the care of the case managers, that they're not required to go out and visit in a 30-day a period, that that waiver has been you know, put in place, especially for Minnesota. Um, but uh, we need to be have them connected some way, and I think that we can get that connection done, you know, starting in the May timeframe, right, with this. So that's one of the things that I wanted to just kind of, I'll just go through the rest of this really quickly. I think we're, we're there with it, um, but go through and talk about, you know, how we're, we're putting together solutions, and then once we're, you know, in uh, the home from that perspective, um, with your contracts to be able to go through and uh, bring in a variety of solutions based on not only, not only your Department of Health Services contract with Minnesota, but also the MCAP contract as well, All right from that. That's correct? That is um, correct. As a matter of fact, I, I do have an update for you and for uh, the, the audience. Uh, we signed yesterday uh, uh, an extension of our MCAP contract. So it was, uh, it was something they wanted to hop on right away and we were able to get it done and, and uh, in, in our basket yesterday. Right, that's good, great, congratulations. So this is one of the things that we, uh, we want to do. Uh, we see multiple priorities in the company, obviously, but if you look at the two biggest priorities, obviously COVID-19, right, is a big priority for us with the kits uh, and the assessments, Mario and team are absolutely on top of that. And then going after um, Minnesota with your team, right, in the joint venture to make sure that this is uh, absolutely executed in a timely manner. Because I think we have a window, potentially May to October timeframe to run with us and actually try to get people connected as fast as we can before uh, the next wave may occur, right, that's out there we if agree. it's coming, right, as well. 
So I think, you know, I, I think we're, we've covered just about everything that's out here under, you know, under the, uh, the Healthy Med initiative from that standpoint. We also want to, you know, it's, it's 11 o'clock, so we do want to wrap up. I know we started a little bit late, um, but I want to tie this into some questions, you know, that have come out about Life 365. And so one of the questions that just came out uh, from George was, you know, how is Life 365 going to do this, right? How is Life 365 going to be able to um, go out in the marketplace and be able to take on the big initiative with COVID-19 uh, and with the Minnesota contract as well? And the simple uh, answer to that is through partners. Through partners like, you know, like Healthy Med, Avicenna, Best Buy, AMR, JNB Medical, and others that are out there. Uh, there are partners that are approaching us to be able to work together. Right, to be able to take our platform, the Life 365 platform, and be able to bring partners on, onto the platform to be able to go after large initiatives. And I think that's the beauty of what we need to do before the beauty of the Life 365 platform. We can't in the future, like we're doing right now, we're doing it ourselves right now, we can't in the future approach you know, pandemics like this or major health initiatives like this and try to figure out what tools fit together. Somebody's got a tool for, you know, for you know, diabetes. Somebody's got a, a tool for logistics. Somebody's got a tool you know, for uh, nursing and monitoring. They've gotta be integrated on the same platform together uh, to make it comprehensive for the consumer. And that's where we believe Life 365 comes in, right, as well. Now, as we progress with Life 365, we're all about trying to put on a, a current platform. We're all about trying to get the right data at the right time for the right outcome to go to the right analytic system and AI system. That's our mission. But what I wanted to share with you in this town hall is our mission is very focused towards COVID-19 and towards our initiative with our partners in Minnesota. So if anybody, I'm gonna wrap up the call because it's a little after 11. I know we started late. I apologize for that. Um, but I also want to wrap up on the fact that um, if anybody is interested in being a partner with Live 365, please contact me directly. Um, I have my, uh, you have my email based on, on this registration. Um, and also that we're raising our investment round as well. We won't go in detail on this call with that, uh, but we're raising an investment round to grow the company, right? To be able to do this, it includes funding, uh, the initiatives that we have out there and to not only take the investment that we already have in the company, but we want to exponentially grow, right, from that perspective. And that's what we should do, right? We should put investment capital around it and grow. So if anybody is interested from that perspective and having a conversation, please contact me directly offline and we'll talk further. But if we don't have any other questions coming, I want to go ahead and sign off. I want to thank everybody that's participated today. Thank you, Tom Spencer from Healthy Med. Thank you, Mario Basu, for being uh, a partner in, in this endeavor with us with Life 365 and uh, with Avicenna. And thank you to all the participants that uh, attendees that have joined uh, from this as well. Um, we are going to, like I said, have our next uh, um, town hall, smoother town hall, next Wednesday night at 4 p.m. Arizona time, 7 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time, and it's going to be about reimbursement, licensure, parity, uh, and uh, and uh, 1135 waivers as well. Well, I believe we'll have on Brian Scarpelli from Connected Health Initiative, and potentially uh, Rob Jaron uh, from CHI as well. So thank you to everybody, and have a safe and healthy day.